Welcome to the second video in this series on OCT interpretation. I am Dr. Julie Rodman. In this segment, I will introduce the topic of variations of the vitreo retinal interface. As you may recall from the first video, in order to really understand OCT interpretation, you must have a solid understanding of the retinal anatomy. On this slide, you can see an anatomic depiction of the various layers of the retinal anatomy. For purposes of today's session, we are going to focus on the area depicted by the purple box, more specifically, the vitreo retinal interface. The most anterior aspect of this interface is the posterior hyaloid, which borders the internal limiting membrane. If you look on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see the various layers of the retinal anatomy outlined. Again, if you were to superimpose the retinal anatomy onto an OCT scan, this is what it would look like. The area that we are focusing on for purposes of today's discussion are the vitreous body, which is the black space on top of the scan, and the most superficial layer of the retina or the internal limiting membrane. The blue arrow is there to kind of direct you or guide you on what area I'm talking about. So the vitreous is what I like to call a dynamic substance. What that means is it is prone to aging, just like other parts of our body are. The aging process of the vitreous really involves two distinct entities. It involves liquefaction or synchesis, and it involves contraction or synergesis. This slide shows the first process, which we call again liquefaction or synchesis. And you can see that within the black space on top of the OCT scan, there's a lot of kind of grayish stuff kind of floating around there. That is the liquefaction of the vitreous, and you can beautifully see it. It's beautifully illustrated on the OCT scan. This slide shows the second entity, vitreous contraction, or the anterior displacement of the vitreous. Usually these two processes of liquefaction and contraction happen in harmony and do not result in any anatomic problems or obscurations to the underlying retina. So together, the processes of vitreous liquefaction and vitreous contraction lead to a posterior vitreous attachment, which really can take years to occur. There are several stages that happen in the process or evolution of a PVD, and what I'd like to show you on the next couple of slides are what these should look like on, in normal individuals that are not having any pathologic type of entities going on. So this first slide here shows you the first stage in what we call a PVD, or posterior vitreous attachment, and we call this a perifoveal vitromacular adhesion. So you can see here that surfacing on the border of the ILM, kind of extending into the vitreous, are these two gray lines. Those are the vitreous bodies, or the posterior hyaloid, still attached surrounding the macula. You can see also on the right-hand side the kind of bend, which indicates the optic nerve head, and you can see that the vitreous is still attached at the optic nerve head. So the first stage of PVD development is beginning to see these kind of pieces of the vitreous kind of far off to the side in more of the broad sense on the top frame. That would be more of a broad VMA. Or on the focal sense of the second slide on the bottom, which would be more of a focal VMA. So again, stage one of a posterior vitreous detachment. This is really the second stage of a vitreo, um, a vitreo macular adhesion, or the second stage of PVD development. You can see here that the vitreous has detached from the macula. However, it is still attached at the optic nerve head. Okay, so when you see that the PVD is kind of floating there but not yet suspended in the vitreous body fully, but still attached at the optic nerve head, this would be a stage two um, PVD or stage two part of vitromacular adhesion. Stage three occurs when you really have lost all contact to the macula, but you can still see this residual adhesion on both sides of the optic nerve head. So what we call this is really a kind of a peripheral PVD with again residual vitropapillary adhesion. And this is an, this is an illustration of the optic nerve with the vitreous extended on both sides. Here you can see a complete PVD or a stage four, um, complete PVD or stage four vitromacular. Actually, this wouldn't even be vitromacular adhesion anymore because now the PVD is completely free and you can see it floating there in the vitreous space. 
And on the right hand side on the picture you can see what we call a Weiss ring. When you see a Weiss ring this is an indication that the vitreous has completely detached from the retina. So I mentioned before that when the two processes of liquefaction and contraction occur in harmony, nothing happens. The retinal anatomy is not affected. The optic nerve head anatomy is not affected. However, when one of those processes occurs either before or after the other, or perhaps one of them occurs uh, with more force or strength than the other, then we can get what we call vitromacular traction or vitropapillary traction, meaning that there has been some obscuration to the underlying morphology or obscuration to the underlying anatomy of these structures. So you can see here on the top left what we call a focal vitromacular traction. So you can see that the vitreous is tugging with quite a bit of force on the internal limiting membrane resulting in a pseudocyst formation or that hyporeflective area in the middle of the scan. The scan below that is another kind of demonstration of a focal vitromacular traction. Again, you can see that there are these cystic spaces that are occurring or resulting from that focal vitromacular traction. If we were to measure the size of the traction or the size of the force or the size of the attachment, it would be less than 1500 microns. And that really is what the definition of a focal uh, vitromacular traction would be. On the right hand side, you can see what we call a broad vitromacular traction. Again, the points of attachment are greater than 1500 microns, resulting in more of a broad type of appearance. The broad vitromacular attractions tend to have a better prognosis than the focal ones because when you pull with a tighter force in a more constricted area, you're more prone to develop a macular hole. Just as you can get vitromacular traction, you can get vitropapillary traction because remember anywhere that the vitreous is attached, you can potentially get an obscuration if the force is too strong. So here you can see what the optic nerve head would look like with vitropapillary traction. Again, you can see the vitreous tugging pretty tightly on the nasal aspect of the optic nerve head there. And when you look at the photo on the right-hand side, you can almost see what we call a pseudopapillodematous appearance because the vitreous is imposing force upon the nasal part of the optic nerve head. So this, this video hopefully served as a nice introduction to diseases of the vitreomacular vitreo papillary interface and again will serve as really a tutorial as we move forward into more advanced interpretation of vitreal retinal disease. Thank you so much for joining me for this, this short webinar and I look forward to seeing you for the next webinar.